if you like betting on golf But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf betting system Greetings and welcome to the Golf Betting System Podcast. It's episode 308. This is our 2024 Charles Swab Challenge plus Sudal Open Bets Pod. Barry O'Hanrahan and Paul Williams join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss our selection for this week's PGA and DP World Tour action. Good morning, gents. Morning, guys. Morning, guys. Visit our world-famous Golf Betting System website where we have in-depth betting previews for both events. We've got strokes gain rankings for the Charles Swab, form stats for both, Plus, of course, new and old predictor models for the Charles Swab and the Sudal Open. All of that content is available across both events, completely free of charge. There's no paywall. On X, Barry is at a good talk golf. Paul is at golf betting. I am at Bamford Golf. Subscribe to the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where this podcast is available along with my weekly golf betting show. You'll be glad to hear... We've broken through 4,500 subscribers as of the PJ Championship last week. So come across, give it a sub, watch the content on there. Now, you guys as listeners power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts. As ever, for those of you who leave a review, I read them out at the start of a future show. Leave your name and where you are in the review. Keep the reviews coming, please. Don't forget also the five-star button on Spotify. We're living on past glories here with this one, guys. The title is No Napping When These Boys Are On, Five Stars. Hi, lads. Long long time listening to the pod. Finally writing my review following Steve's perseverance. Whether in sickness or health, the jingle soothes my soul. And I can't wait to hear Steve, Barry and Paul crack on with the in-depth research. I followed the Jake Knapp win recently, as I say, past glories, which contributed significantly to my lad's golf trip to Marbella this week. Thank you so much. Top, top content and looking forward to the next big boom, courtesy of you boys. That is from Greg and Greg is in Dublin. Greg, thanks for your time on that one. Brilliant stuff, Greg. Yeah, That's good, good spending of the money. Yeah, I expect that. Um, I bet that trip to Marbella is a long distance memory now, isn't it? Way in the uh, rear view mirror. Barry, this is the review that ended with Togobogger. What's that mean? Can you pronounce Tog, that? Togobogger is take it easy. Take it easy. Okay. We're taking it easy, Greg. Right. Let's talk about the PJ Championship, shall we? Hmm. Uh, course was rubbish. Well, the conditions didn't really help it, did it? Uh, well, we did say it had been raining for like mm. 39 months consecutively. <laughs> and then people expect it to sort of have 15 stimp greens. That wasn't going to happen. <laughs> um, I was a bit surprised the, the the rough wasn't as long as we've seen recently. But maybe I suppose they thought, and we did focus on this as well, length of the course, size of the greens. If they were going to put seriously four or five inch rough close to the fairways, it was going to be too penal. Yeah. Yeah, it's you not You just US weren't open. going to get the balls to stop on those green surfaces. No. But yeah, it was, it was just 2014 all over again, wasn't it, with the, with the greens? They weren't quite as soft as we saw with Rory's win, but there was a tiny bit of release come Sunday, but not a great deal. Um. I personally enjoyed the tournament, but I suppose you always enjoy a major when you've got someone in the race, don't you? I mean, I, 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 I struggle to get excited about a golf tournament when my guys have all missed the cut or you know my leading chance is like 17 groups back on a Sunday. Hmm. But it, it was nice to have a horse in the race, Bryson DeChambeau. But, and let's give credit where credit's due, I'm seeing a lot of content, a lot of comments out there about, oh, Xander only won because of this, and Xander only did this because of that. And No, Xander 
shot a major championship record low total on Thursday to open his account and was in control of that tournament pretty much throughout, I thought. Even on Sunday when you were watching the early the early action on the Rolex hour, which I really do love on Sky Sports, that Rolex hour when you actually all you get is sixty minutes of shots. Wouldn't wouldn't it be great yeah. if golf content so was like that all the time? No. If it was yeah, like no. it all the time, we wouldn't appreciate it. Yeah, like um, yeah, true, I suppose. But you do appreciate I, the Rolex hour. It is when good. when that when that hour happens, it is put the phone down and just get lost in it, and it is really really good. Yeah, exactly. Um, Agree. Yeah. But Xander just he, he, when Bryson was charging, Xander would just always respond. Yeah. So fair play to. Him. I did read a yeah. post this morning on X. I did read it out to you guys. Through 28 major starts, Xander now has a win and a true strokes gained average of 2.3 strokes per round. That is better than Rory, 2.2. We're comparing here over those 28, first 28 starts. B, uh, Brooks Kepka 2.1, John Rahm, 2, and Jordan Spieth, 2. That's the consistency of Xander. Yeah, and it... It is that consistency which constantly brings his price down to the kind of level that we saw pre-event last week, where what was the eighteen very very best price with the fewest best places, Victor. yeah, and yeah. if you were trying to get some extended places, well, I saw him as short as ten to one, and you know we've talked a lot about Xander over the last few weeks and months, and some of the Sundays that he's experienced and you know the week before where Rory kind of put on the afterburners and just left him for dust and you look at the price coming into a major championship and it's a little off putting more than a little off putting because it's always so short but that consistency and we brought this out either I forget if it was in the tips pod or the preview pod but you could invariably back him for as an each way chance and there's a very good chance that with extended places you were going to get some kind of return out of it it's just whether mm. he could muster that uh you know those four rounds to actually get the job done but this was his week and as you say very impressive um impressive to do it wire to wire impressive to hold off someone of the quality of bryson and bryson didn't do anything wrong did he Ultimately. 64 on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> 60, 67, 64 at the weekend. Yeah. And he he was brilliant. Mm. Had the crowd with him as well. So, I mean, I, I don't buy this. He, he only won because of X, Y, and Z, because you can apply that to every single tournament and every single thing in life. And it's just bitter. Yeah. Like, f- figure out the reason, you know, the reasons why he did it, not why, what prevented him or, you know, what allowed him to do it. The reality is Xander went and shot a record score on a course that was, yeah, it was unfortunately not as much of a challenge as we all wanted to see, but produced a really exciting finish and he he passed the test better than anybody else this week. Yeah. Question for you now, now that Xander's broken that duck. So I, I swore off backing Xander a while ago um, just because the, the figures didn't really match up if you kept backing him. It didn't make sense to me. It now that he's broken that kind of broken through the ceiling, do you, are you more or less likely to back him in majors and, and tournaments? It, you know, assuming not blind back, but assuming it looks like suitable for him that week. Um, personally, probably not for this season. I, I suspect I could be proven to be completely wrong, but I suspect this will be a big weight off his shoulders and it, you could find one of these post major breakthrough scenarios where a player Lulls. just Lulls. Um, doesn't do much for a while because they're in this period of, you know of, of contemplation and uh, adjustment having finally got that uh, got that breakthrough i could be wrong we'll see but yeah I, and and his price again it's it's not, it's not going to go any longer really is it you know, unless, unless his form falls right off a cliff, you're going to be stuck with these kind of 12, 14, 16 to 1 at best major championship prices. And in, in you know, lower grade regular events, it's going to be even shorter. Not for me. 
The trouble with Xander's game is it travels everywhere. Mm. Yeah. And I I, I, reg- I take you back to 2022, the last time he won. He won the Zurich Classic of New Orleans with our old friend Patrick Cantlay. Fifth at the Byron Nelson. He then went 13th, 18th, 14th. He won the Travellers. He then came straight to Scotland, won the Scottish Open. So he has got form of stringing results together. That's three wins. I know it's a, uh, one's a, a, a team win. That's three wins in seven. And one thing I will say about Pinehurst is Pinehurst is a is a golf course for the US Open that's going to be considerably more about short game and creative short game. Greens, runoff areas, no rough, or sand everywhere. Yeah, I personally I, I would rather be I would back a Xander over a Rory at Pinehurst. But Rory will be far shorter in the market. Mm. It'll be interesting just to see even the first one or he'll be, I'm guessing he's probably only gonna play once between now and the US Open. Yeah, he'll play Memorial, yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see even just what sort of performances there, even if he makes the cut or if he bombs out and misses the cut, then that's a a sign that he might have fallen into that lull. Or a little bit of that lull, post major lull. Mm. Some, something tells me there's a good chance he doesn't. That, that, that something was like properly unlocked by getting mm. kind of slapped around the week before in the final round. Yeah, yeah. We have to see. I'm interested to I'm interested to watch what happens. Mm. And I, it was I, as soon as I saw as he got in front last week, I said I want to see him go out and just beat everybody because. When he's hitting the ball that well, it's awesome to watch. Scotty Scheffler, four to one to win the US Open, as short as seven to two with Bet Paddy Power. Rory McElroy, eleven to one. Xander is fourteen to one in a spot, but is twelve to one generally available. Rahm at sixteens, Hovland eighteens, Ludwig Oberg and Kepka at twenties. That's where we're at with the US Open as it stands. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> Need to do some digging into Pinehurst, which I'm going to do this week for the US Open research article. But just remembering Martin Keimer and the way that he disassociated himself from the rest of the field that week. Damn. If Brooke, if uh, if Scotty Scheffler hasn't got a uh, appearance at Louisville state court that week <laughs> I think Scotty's going to take all the beating especially of, on agronomy that is right up his street 3rd of June I think I read yesterday was the next oh it's already out there is it yeah, yeah, yeah. don't say that as gospel because it was a, a post on X but um, sounds about right I think out of interest on the PGA over the weekend, DeChambeau 131 shots, Hovland and Lowry tied 132. What a performance from Shane, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Xander 133 tied with the Rose and Billy Ho. Since I put him on that post it a note of doom, Billy Ho is Fine. like a different player. <laughs> I look forward to uh, giving him a fist pump at Wentworth later in the year. This name was the one that jumped out at me, though. 134 shirts, Tommy Fleetwood, Corey Connors, and Rio Hisatsune. Mm. Interesting. Also fascinating to see Thomas Dietrich get a first top 10 finish at a major. Fourth spot. I think that's, I was thinking about this this morning, brushing my teeth. Dietrich, now you think Ryder Cup next year. He's really had an impressive year, hasn't he? Mm-hmm. He's got to get a win, though, hasn't he? Well, yes, it, it would be nice, but you've, it's got, you've got to see that coming at some point. He, he hasn't even won on the DP World Tour, has he? No, it was um, that Pairs event with uh, Thomas Peters was the only oh, one. Oh, the World won. Cup? Yeah. In Austria. Oh, mm. Aus- Austria. Australia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Also, going back to our research podcast uh, for the PGA, I mentioned top 40 for driving distance and a decent finish at the Open. And it was a fascinating to see a leaderboard that had Open candidates all over it. Morikawa, Open champion. Lowry, Open champion. 
uh, Chauvelé. He'd finished second at Carnoustie in 2018. He was 39th for driving distance going into that tournament. Mm. So yet again, I wouldn't say the biggest of hitters, but certainly well above average, top top 20 to 25% for driving distance, Xander. And he won by one shot from Bryson DeChambeau, who's the longest golfer on live right now at 319 yards per drive. So yet again, another PGA Championship dominated or what dominated at the end by the big hitters. Mm. That's the only reason I thought Morikawa wouldn't actually win that. Just doesn't have mm. the pure length yeah. that the winner tends to always have. Yeah, on a pure PGA Championship setup. He played well. I, I, you know, I talked about him in the pre-pod and then didn't back him, so I was rather concerned when he was um, doing so well. But yeah, ultimately, just not quite enough, I suppose. Just a weird Sunday for him. Mm. It was like everything was just a fraction off. Like the pro shots just weren't close enough. The putts just weren't good enough, and it all just kept building on top of each other to, to not unlocking the birdies early on. Just yep. it, it felt like you know those you get the weird days where you just you, you know you're pretty close to everything being right, whether it be golf or anything. But there's just something you can't put your finger on that's just keeping you from feeling completely comfortable. And it looked really like one of those days for him. Just the eye test yeah um it's really flat wasn't could it? so yeah could so easily if he dropped a birdie early on could so easily have just gone on, on a run um because what's the major I, though that I, always suits the shorter hitters I, it's it's pinehurst i was just thinking about him for pinehurst oh, I, I was thinking more for true were you hmm. maybe open champion from sandwich could say that Try and pick the bones, though, out of Henrik Stenson and Phil Mickelson from the last one and try and find courses that both <laughs> play well at. I know, they just ball-struck the hell out of that week. The two of them were just flushing it. Mm. Which which would make sense for Morikawa there as well, then. It would, wouldn't it? Yeah. And straight. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. Uh, just t- uh, DeChambeau went on to my list of seconds for the year. I'll just update that. I've got a post-it note for it, of course. Bradley, Falamaki, uh, Harmon, Cam Young, Scheffler, Taylor Moore, Tigala, DeChambeau. My it's second post is for 2024. It's a, a post-it scroll, not a post-it note, Steve. It's well, I'm so about long. to go on to a second post-it for these second places. <laughs> It'd probably be this way. You'd have to get some of those bigger ones, Steve. Yeah, I've never actually seen those in Costco. <laughs> I'll have to have a look next time I'm over there. Mm. Get a bigger one. <laughs> right, let's talk this week. Oh, I'll tell you what else I was going to quickly mention before we do move on. I do apologise. President's Cup. Uh, talking Team America here. Top six. Scheffler, 10,233 points. Next best, Sander, 6,170. He's a one-man teams guy. Scotty, Xander at two. Wyndham Clark at three, Colin Morikawa up one to four, Sahith Tigala at five. Didn't go well on Sunday, did it for Sahith? No. I was absolutely cussing him after that Quail Hollow performance, thinking he is one shot off the lead of a major. That is just so typical that he would win it. Mm. Uh, made that sort of nine, 900 foot putt on the first, and from that point it was um, collapsation. Six is Max Homer. I'll tell you the interesting thing I'm finding here is, Cantley, Harmon, Kirk, Henley, Eric, Cole and JT Post. And clearly we've got quite a few tournaments to go. But at the moment, Sam Burns is outside the top 12. Justin Thomas is outside the top 12. Uh, Tony Finau is 18th. And Jordan Spieth is 25th in qualification. Now, I know that they would pick Jordan Spieth over anybody, like they did with JT last year. So, But uh, you can see a situation where what, at least one of the Ryder Cup team from last year doesn't make it. Yeah, potentially. I mean, Sahith in fifth place, that's pretty much cemented. I mean, he's he, he, he's, he's likely to drop, but... I'd say, I mean, I'm, I can't remember Cam Young last year, didn't he? Was he in ninth spot on the qualification list and didn't get a pick? Mm. It is jobs for the boys, isn't it? 
And this is the same, six straight and six picks. Yeah, for both teams, six mm. and six. Internationals, to be fair, Matsuama Day, Ben Arn, who's having the season of his life, still hasn't won. Tom Kim, Nick Taylor, Sung J Im, and then Minwoo Lee, Siwoo Kim, Corey Connors at nine, Grio ten, champion this week at Charles Schwab, Adam Hadwin at eleven, and the last space is Christian Bezedenhout. They have got a situation where Adam Scott isn't in the top twelve. He's fourteenth and not playing particularly well. Yeah, it's up and down. It needs to play more events, I expect. All I like to look at these rankings for, you're looking for players here that you know are going to start coming under pressure like Ricky Fowler did last year to get into the Ryder Cup team and they will start to find some form. I mean, JT's finding it slowly, isn't he? I, I was quite impressed with JT last week. I think he was first for T to green across the whole week. Mm. Clearly can't part, but that part will warm at some point. Tony Finau, another one. Dangerous this week, I think, Fee now. I think he was first for strokes gained on approach last week at the PGA Championship of the whole field. But he was he was virtually last for strokes gained off the tee. He was wayward, mate. Apart from the fourth hole on the final round where he drove the green. I think every other green, every other fairway was being missed with regularity. Right, we move on. Charles Swab Challenge this week. So I, I love the catchy name. Let's call it the CSC, shall we? To add complexity, Hogan's Alley, or Colonial Country Club, has been renovated since we saw it last year. The tournament was won last year by our good friend, friend of the post-it note, Emiliano Grillo. Tells you, I don't know what that tells you, but... Grio loved this course and won here last year, 80 to 1. Right. There is quite a lot of content out there in terms of the Gil Hans renovation. It's been extended to 7,289 yards as a par 70. So I categorise it as a medium length golf course. Classical, very old style. It's interesting, the restoration goes back to the 1941 US Open, I believe. And the work they've done does look particularly spectacular. They've kind of, you're going to love this, Barry, they've kind of de-PGA toured Colonial. So where over the years it had been covered in, the golf course had been covered in concrete, cart paths, intruding on parts of the course where... It was genuinely part of the playing course previously. All of that stuff's been stripped. And they've now gone back to how it used to be with Baranka on a lot of the holes. All of the beautifully PGA to a circle kind of bunkers have been removed and they've now got jagged, jagged edged bunkers that are a lot more um, penal, a lot more lynx-like. They've taken all of the raised greens that had been raised just pure through play year in, year out. They've all been removed and they've been lowered. So you can now actually play bump and run into the greens on the PGA Tour. You can play bump and run approach shots. Wow. It's revolutionary. I do love Gil Hans. He, when it comes to renovations, he does such great work. It's unbelievable. I mean, Marion, Oakmont. Los Angeles Country Club for the US Open last year. The work that this guy does, Southern Hills to 2022 PGA Championship, it's great work. So I'm looking forward to the course. Theoretically, though, it, I'm not sure it changes a great deal because it's still old style, medium length. It's still bent grass greens and it is still Bermuda grass rough and Bermuda grass fairways. We're moving away from the Zoysia that we saw last week up in Kentucky. I love the sound of this, guys. The bent grass, the new bent grass on the greens. 007 XL bent grass. Can't get better than that, can it? 007 XL bent grass. Mm. We haven't got a bond. Heard in the of it? We haven't got a bond in the field, have we? We haven't got a bond. I'd love to know why they describe it as 007 XL. Is it like? Is this like the type of bent grass that's like smooth, you know, classy? could be wearing a tuxedo <laughs> like what the characteristics of the bent grass are shaken not stirred 
I've got the yeah. email of the course superintendent if you want to actually ask him the question, Baron. I'll forward it on to you. <laughs> Interesting. And from you know, just from general, these course superintendents are lovely guys, and they tend to come back to you. So he'll probably give you the answer. 00, 007 XL Bengrass. Green size is 5,000 square feet on average, so pretty much the same as we saw last week at Valhalla. The wind is set to blow this week, chaps. I'm seeing at least 20 mile an hour gusts every single day. It's meant to get mighty hot, up to 36 degrees Celsius, which is the hottest tournament of the year so far by a mile. Clearly, the breeze will take a little bit off that. High humidity. What we have seen here with winners recently is Grio 8 under, Burns 9 under, Kokrag 14 under. Berger, I believe, was a very soft golf course at 15 under. Now, there's rain in the forecast for Thursday and thunderstorms. So I do think we're going to see some kind of suspension in play Thursday. Whether that causes some... There was quite a big bias, wasn't there? AM, PM at the um, PGR. I think it was one and a half strokes, I heard. Mm. It was great because all four of mine were in the AM section. <laughs> Never normally works like that. It's all, it was almost as if they put Scotty in the PM for a reason, but I wouldn't go down that um, that route. Oh, we haven't mentioned Scotty and his arrest, but you know, I suppose that's kind of tittle-tattle, isn't it? To a certain extent, um, Friday I've never seen scenes like that. Um, absolutely shocking. The guy that the guy that got fatally injured, unfortunately, was a volunteer, I believe, that was going to do security work for the day. Mm. Yeah, I read that. Got run over on the way to work. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Yeah, so so uh, commiserations there. Um, it's just one of those weeks, I suppose, that's post major. And, you know, I've got a spreadsheet for everything. Last four post-PGAs, this is what the winners did in their previous outing at the Major. Kevin Nart missed the cut. Jason Kokrag in 2021 was 49th at the PGA. Sam Burns in 2022 was 20th. Emiliano Grio missed the cut. So That's miscut, helpful. miscut, forty nine twenty. Do you have a an average finishing position the week before for let's say the top five, six, or ten in the in Colonial? No, no. Sorry to put I you don't. on the spot. Just felt like an interesting one to see, like how what the blend is. It's funny because you go to the the U.S. Open and you go to the Travelers. Ches Reevy, third at the US Open. Harris English, third at the US Open. Xander, 14th at the US Open. And then last year, TPC River Highland specialist Keegan Bradley missed the cut at the US Open. So you do see players that have contended at the US Open winning the Travellers. But at this particular event, you don't. And there are quite a few from last week that are playing this because it is a respected tournament at Hogan's Alley. Mm. You know, your, your Fort Worth, Dallas-based players all play it. You've got uh, Colin come down here, Colin Morikara. It's not a bad field for a non-elevated event. Tony Finau's playing. Max Home has come down. So it's not as if you're getting bad, you know, a severe Brian Harmon. Minwoo Lee. It's not as if you're getting a severe drop off. This isn't like a Houston Open from a few months ago when it was basically Scotty against the field. There's a bit of quality in there. So I'm thinking, um, apparently as well, this golf course traditionally is one of the golf courses where it's got a very heavy penalty for missing fairways. Now, we're talking about 0.4 to 0.5 of a shot on the par 4s and the par 5s for missing fairways. Now, I can only see that with this renovation getting worse as a penalty because a lot of these holes now have Barranca kind of traversing the edge of fairways and streams now, water streams that weren't there before. They've been covered up and put into tunnels, 
well, they've been completely obliterated by Gil Hans and his team, and we've now got those streams and waterways running down the sides of fairways. So actually, I think you've got to be fairly... You've got to be a golfer that's gaining strokes off the tee through not only length, but accuracy this week as well. And you're going to be playing in conditions that are, you know, Texas tough in terms of the wind. I'm looking forward to it. it should be a, it, I don't see this being a birdie fest. I think this is going to be a difficult to tell. We haven't seen the course. I mean, we've had single digits win this a couple of the most recent years. Could this be like a, I don't know, I'm guessing. So it's either going to be high single digits or low double digits, I reckon. The par fives here, there's only two of them. Both pretty much three shotters as well. Unless you are particularly long off the tee. Long and straight. Anything to add? Anything to, any questions? Anything you can throw into it? before we move on to our selections? No, I, th- I think it will be interesting to see. Um, the greens are likely to be really quite firm if they've been relayed. Yes. So, mm-hmm. Great point. Um, I suspect we're going to find greens more difficult to hold, so it could well put the emphasis... Well, you know, it, it, it sounds like there's a, the emphasis is on quite a few of the different metrics. So, But yeah, if scrambling is going to be quite important, then... Um, you know, putting's going to be important, but equally, you just said that <laughs> dry driving's going to be quite important. So, yeah, it does kind of suggest it's going to be a relatively um, high scoring, so relatively tough renewal. But looking we'll at the old, col- well, looking at the old colonial pool, seventeenth through off the tee, eleventh through approach, thirty second around the green, sixth tee to green, sixth putting. Mm. Were the were the strokes gain numbers of the champions in the in the field that made the cup when you averaged them through? Yeah. So when I say good driving, not se- not necessarily massive strokes off the tee, but being gained like Bryson DeChambeau last week, but straighter would be handy. If you go all the way back to 2010, driving accuracy twentieth in the field for all of the champions. You know, 14 champions going back to Zach Johnson. You had to be in the top 20 for for fairways hit. Driving distance, 33rd. Now, that isn't often you see that on the PGA Tour, where accuracy is outranking driving distance. Yeah. One thing I do think, and that, that, that number I think is going to change, will be the importance of around the green this week. Because as you said, great point. These bent grass greens, they, they, they're going to be quail hollow like from a fortnight ago, aren't they? You would have thought they're going to reject approach shots. They've only been laid a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. It tends to be like that. Interestingly enough, they're using new technology on this golf course. They're using, um, they're using water uh, hydronics under the, under the greens that can not only warm the greens, they can actually cool them as well because there's such extremes of temperature down here in Texas. Mm. So it's not sub air as such. It's actually using water to either cool or heat the greens in the winter. That's crazy. It's the only way they can keep bent grass in good condition throughout the winter to keep basically to warm the green surfaces. Um, traditionally, as well here, that sixth and six split. That's fifty four percent tee to green, forty six percent with the putter strokes gain. So I think you're going to have to be positive with the putter this week. Mm. Right, I've gone for five. I'm going to go in reverse order because I think the bet of the week... I mean, I've taken a lot of stick on Twitter this week, and quite rightly, because I've put up Scotty Scheffler. But I didn't get anyone praising me for finding 66-1 to one on Sepp Stracker, which I think is an incredible prize. So I managed to get 66 to 1 with Unibet, six places each way, which goes against my narrative of always trying to get as many each way places as possible. But there was no way I was turning down 66 to 1 on Sepp Stracker this week. And as we have seen in the past, two of the last four winners of this missed the cut of the PGA. I think on a golf course where being moderately long and straight, good approach play is key, I think this this course theoretically plays to Sepp's strengths. I know they're not Bermuda grass greens, but he's playing off of Bermuda grass fairways and in Bermuda grass rough. 
And as we know with Sepp, he really is a Bermuda monster. He's also won on bent grass. He won the John Deere Classic last year. And actually, when you look at previous winners here, like Glio, he's been second at the John Deere Classic. Daniel Berger's been fifth. Kevin Nars had a second at the John Deere Classic and a top 10 at the John Deere Classic. That's without Jordan Spieth. And we know that Jordan Spieth's record, both here and at the John Deere Classic, is very, very strong. So I took the 66 to 1 on Sepp Strucker. And I also went through another 66 to 1 shot with Bet Fred eight places each way via their pick your place market. Austin Ekro. Have you have you been had money on Ekro this year, Paul? Yeah, I, I forget which we've one mentioned it was. him in our previous podcast, haven't we? I know that for a yeah, fact. I backed him two or three weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, to no avail, but yeah. Just love his numbers. Mm. Oklahoma born, educated, lives in Oklahoma, state next door. Loves the agronomy. Second at the Byron Nelson La uh, in twenty twenty three. Uh, there is a mistake on my preview that I'm actually changing on my PC right now. I will email that to you, Paul. He's also had some other good finishes in Texas as well. The thing I remember with Ekro, how impressive he was in high winds at PGA National when he won the Cognizant Classic. Mm. Beautiful ball striker. Straight, fairly long, great approach play. And he hasn't really dropped off since that maiden PGA Tour victory. He's still churning out great results. 17th at Harbour Town, 11th at the Zurich Classic in New Orleans with his close friend, Chris Gotterup, who then went on to win a PGA Tour event at Myrtle Beach. He was also 10th last year at Los Angeles Country Club at the US Open, a Gil Hans renovation. 18th on his debut here last year at Colonial, Austin, Austin Ekro. Um, I know I've gone in reverse. I'm not even really going to go through Scotty Scheffler, but I thought I'd just put him in there at three. He's 14 to five. There's a bit of three to one out there. He's seven to two with Paddy Power to win the US Open in a couple of weeks' time. So, whilst they're dangling three to one out there, I think this course is pretty perfect for him. He's straight, he's long. There was a lot of chatter that he's going to WD. I don't see him WD because A, this is the this is kind of his boyhood tournament. He used to come here every year with his dad to watch it. He lives in Dallas. I thought he's just glad to be home and will want to play it, knowing Scotty. I think this means a lot to him. So as you'd know this as well, Paul, he was a late entry into the field. So he I can't was, yeah. see him being a late entry and then coming out of the field. That doesn't make any sense at all. So I no, think he'll play. I think you're right. I think if he were to withdraw then the emphasis is going to be back on the next time he tees it up, whereas you might just might as well just get it all out of the way. Um, and uh, yeah, home comforts as well. It's, yeah, it's going to be more more comfortable to do it this week than it would be further down the line. So, yeah, I always sit there and I think you could do all this work finding all of these win you know winners that don't win, and Scotty Scheffler wins by six on a golf course that's actually going to be renovated to come even more to his strengths of short game. Chipping, great approach play. So, yeah, would not be surprised to see him win this. Uh, I think him winning in Texas and him winning at Colonial, Hogan's Alley, would mean something very, very, uh, something very, uh, it's something he would have in his locker of, of kind of things to achieve in the, in the pro game. Mm. And we saw what he did at the RPC Heritage when he completely turned the narrative on his head and won the Masters and then won the RBC Heritage because he set it as a goal to do it. And this guy is just phenomenal. Where are you guys pitching in at? Because all of my all of my tips are 50, 60, and those two 66s. So where, where are you coming in, Paul? Let's start with you. Where, where are you pitching your uh, your tent this week at Colonial? Yeah, I've got, I've got two that I've backed. Um, the first one is 50 to 1. Um, Danny McCarthy I've backed. Uh, 50 to 1 that was with the 8 places with Hills and um, a lot of this comes from reading your preview actually because if you dig through those putting stats that you talked about um, it really does stick out that um, just the raw putting average stats over the years have been really quite prominent from the winners mm. so 
I want a putter on the team, and there's yeah. very few who are on the same kind of level as Denny McCarthy. Um, he, he leads your rolling strokes game putting stats actually um, over the last few weeks. Yeah, yeah, I, you, know, you, you don't have to look far for Denny because he tends to be right. He's number up there. one. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he tends to be right up there with the. Um, with the putting stats anyway, he was second um, at Texas where he was third for strokes game putting, uh, sixth at Quay Hollow, he was sixth for strokes game putting. Um, yeah, you you remember the uh, the Texas Open one where he was uh, he was pushing our man right to the very, very end. But uh, yeah, for me, putter, um, short game as well. Denny's got a fantastic short game. Um, he's been right up there with the scrambling stats over the last few weeks as well. Not the best of records here, but Again, just reading some of your commentary on this, the recent winners haven't necessarily been peppering the leaderboards here, um, but they have got some experience. So the fact he's yeah. played it a few times, um, 27th for the year before last, 15th to halfway. So there is, there's a little bit of form there, but nothing spectacular. But yeah, I, I, th- I think I think he fits. And the fact it's been renovated and the fact it probably does play a little bit more into his hands in that respect, I think he could... Uh, could go well this week, Danny. I've just maximised the technical golf course variable on our predictor model this week, Paul. Mm. So single digits, the maximum I take it to is sort of 11, 12 under winning. And, you know, people basically in the each way places could be on six or seven, you know, tough yep. scoring. Scotty Scheffler, 500 points. There's a surprise. Next best, Tony Fee now, 220. So he's better. He's he's over half better than Tony Fee mm. now. Denny McCarthy sitting there, top fifteen. Yeah. When the score, he's a bit Mackenzie Hughes like, isn't he? When the scoring gets tough, he tends to gravitate. Yeah, yeah. When you can short game yourself and putt yourself out of trouble, and he can do that. He can certainly. Do oh god, you. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, yeah. Denny's in for me. The other one I've got is two hundred and fifty to one. So um, we'll let Barry have a go nice, and then we can Paul. do that afterwards. 250 to 1. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Just out of interest, there's only been one triple digit winner of this since 2010, and that was Boo Weekly. Mm. And Boo Weekly was a 100 to 1 when he won it. So it tends to be someone towards the top of the betting market that does win this. What I will say is, of recent years, the shortest price we have had is 30 to 1. There's a lot of 50 and 60 to 1 winners of this. I mean, mm. Grio last year was 80 to 1. So it's quite encouraging that we might see another plus 50 to 1 winner this week. Interestingly enough, 18 to 1 I put Xander down for last week. He was really 16s in most spots. But that's only the second 16 to 1 winner. That 16 to 20 to 1 price point, Horschel now and Xander. So that we are starting to get a few more winners in that sort of 16, 20s, 25 to 1 mark. Yeah, second Which tier. is encouraging. A bit more encouraging mm. from either sort of single digits or 50 to 1 plus. Right, Barry, where are you? Ba- based on the start about not going well the week before and that, you know, being okay for going into this week, I'm going to stick with Sep. Good luck. with you on that. Bit of a bit, bit of a disappointment last week, but, you know, on this we go. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll believe that when I see it. <laughs> he's top. He's top eight in that technical chart I was just mentioning. He's tied with Chris Kirk and Sung J Im. Doesn't mind it when the wind blows. Remember when he won the Honda mm. Classic? Yeah, he's all right. Sep in these conditions. So the, the next, the next I have is in around that as well. I've backed Aaron Rye. Mm-hmm. Just any time I was running up some models of stats that I think will be important this week, he just keeps popping and popping, and I kind of said, "Well, okay, let's just go and do it." So I did. Um, I don't. I, I don't it look interesting to see if he has the whatever it's required to go get that win. He, playing some decent golf in in some spots this year, popping up a lot um, on leaderboards. So twelfth here last year. Uh, made the cut the year before, so it's the two times he's played it. So there's some sort of comfort factor there. Um, let's see if it goes a bit higher this week. Yeah. The, the, 
there's one who Lucas Glover. I'm debating this one. He's just a lot of lot of popping up a lot on any of these um, predictors that I'm doing. Any thoughts, or did, did he come close for you guys, or is he one of your picks? I struggle with Lucas on a golf course that theoretically needs good putting. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, the thing is, you look at the name like uh, Boo Weekly, um, even Emiliano Grio, and you know you kind of think, well, potentially it does fit into that bracket. I'm kind of off Lucas a little bit now because you'll know I backed him a few times in the last few months and mm. not really done anything. So, so I've freed him up for you, Barry. So it should be should be all yours. <laughs> He's softened. His two to green game is still <laughs> exceptionally good. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's well, just can. that he's 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 making Scotty Scheffler look like Kevin Nile with a putter. Yeah. <laughs> just needs to rekindle that form from last summer, doesn't he, with the flat stick? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and maybe 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 with the new greens or the newly laid greens, they're just a little bit funky for everybody, so it doesn't put the spotlight yeah. on his not so great putting as much as it would on another week. Mm. Uh, I would assume that here, all the, all the I, greens I, books have been thrown in the bin because there, there's yeah. 18 completely new green camp complexes yeah. yeah which is clearly everyone's starting on a, on a level playing field so i get that i don't have anybody else shorter i've one i've one longer one um i'm deciding if i go to anybody shorter or not like nobody's really jumping off the page i went taylor moore Got 60 to 1 with William Hill, eight places each way on Taylor Moore. One last year at the Val Spa at Copperhead. Now, if you look at Colonial Champions Sam Burns, Jason Kokrag, and Kevin Nahr, they have a fantastic record around Copperhead. So I love that. I was on Taylor Moore. He's, I've already mentioned him once on this podcast. He was second this year for me in Houston at 70 to 1. So clearly can play well down in Texas. On top of that, I believe I believe he's a local lad. Yeah, he's, he is a Texan. I believe he lives in the Dallas area, so he's you know got home comforts with the whisk. Yeah, he's within. He lives within half an hour of the golf course. He's had two attempts here, two missed cuts. But I think he, he, Taylor Moore. I just keep seeing him popping up on leaderboards. I mean, he was twentieth at Augusta. Yeah, he was fourth after thirty six holes at Quail Hollow the other week in that signature event, and then. I think he teed off the group before Rory and Xander, the second last group on Saturday, and that did for him mentally. But he's just there or thereabouts most weeks, and he was 12th last week at the PGO. So I think Taylor Moore's got plenty about him. Wouldn't be surprised if he, if he won, you know, another his second PGO to a victory at 60 to 1 this week. I'd get that. And the other one, a real horse for a course, this guy. If you actually look at the strokes gain rankings that Paul pulled together for Colonial. Now, yes, I know that the course has changed, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you want a, you want a guy that loves this golf course. He ranked second to only Jordan Spieth around here for strokes gain total of those that have played more than once at Colonial. Harris English. Now, I, I got him at 50 to 1 with William Hill, eight places each way yesterday. I, I was quite shocked this morning to see he'd been absolutely smashed in the betting market. I can't. What's the best he's on now? He's like thirty threes or something. Yeah, he's been hammered, hasn't he? He's been absolutely hammered. Uh, William Hill literally within the last thirty seconds have outed him to thirty five to one. But yeah, Harris English, uh, top twenty last week, played really well with the approach and the putter, putting lights out right now. And just those three wins that he, uh, some of the wins he's got. Forget about Kapalua, but TPC Southwind, El Chameleon. And River Highlands, all non par seventy twos, all sort of medium, medium in le- length. South wind. The other two are shorter, but likes shorter courses, likes non par seventy twos, and absolutely thrives around here. So I took I took uh, English at fifty to one as well. So Scheffler for me, English, Taylor Moore, Eckerote, and Sepp Strucker. Right on to um, I, I want to hear your long shots. Who's going first? 
Yeah, well, I will because it's, it's, it's not as so. far out as it's not as far out as yours. Um, I backed. I don't know why this record here is is two missed cuts. None of the rounds are particularly bad, so I'm hoping he's just in better form this year going in. It looks like he is. It's Grace and Sig. Yeah. Mm. You talk, I mean, consistency. This guy is incredible at the moment, isn't he? He's barely getting any coverage. But Sig, his results are pretty, pretty impressive. It has to be said. Uh, yeah, nice oh, run. Grace, Nin- yeah. Ninth, ninth, ninth eighth, at Corrales, miscut. eighth at yeah. the team event, and 13th at Myrtle Beach last time out. Hmm. So yeah, it took a hundred to one eight places to get the few extra places. Could have got him at one twenty fives with shorter, but um, yeah, I liked the little few extra places there. So Grace and Sig for you. I was trying to get my head around. Um, what price did you say, Paul? Two hundred and fifty to one. I'll give you a clue. It comes from well, he was born in Dallas. Played Corn Ferry last year. Won a couple of times on the Corn Ferry. Oh, did you see who won the Corn Ferry this week? Oh, yeah, Harry Higgs, yeah. Harry Higgs. Oh, Ben Coles. Ben Coles, 250 to 1. Yeah. He's playing some lovely stuff, isn't he? Yeah, he, you remember he came um, came really close at the CJ Cup, Byron Nelson, yeah. didn't he? Um, bogeyed the last when he was going up the, going up the final hole with a one-shot lead and... Bogued the last and let Taylor Pendrith through, but um, mm-hmm. could, could easily have won that. He's playing some um, great stuff, Ben Coles. Yeah, you'd, you'd hope he's got the nous to to learn something from that experience and to push on. He he can win that two wins last year, as I say, four wins in total on the Corn Ferry. So he's he can get over the line at a, at a level. And uh, there's some really good metrics coming out of that performance at uh, the Byron. Seventh for approach, eighth for tee to green, eleventh for putting. Major debut last week, 26th, um, mm-hmm. ninth for strokes game putting. So, yeah, pretty impressive, I think, from Ben Cole. So, 250 to 1 for a guy who has come really close quite recently, mm-hmm. I thought was worth taking on. So, yeah, just Cole's in the Funny, isn't it? Is it, this is it. He, he did absolutely nothing on any kind of Bermuda grass. And then he went to, was it the CJ Cup that he came close to winning? That's right, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Bent grass greens, all of a sudden, these different players just pop out. Yeah. Did well last week at the PGA Championship. Yeah. He's not a long hitter, so this course is pretty perfect for him. Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's lots of positives there for a guy who's um, so far down the uh, down the betting. Right, let's move on, shall we? Mm. We've got the European Tour, sorry, DP World Tour, returning to Europe this week. How exciting. Indeed. European golf is back. Our first trip to mainland Europe in uh, 2024 and since the back end of, uh, well, been, been the autumn last year, wasn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> since we were since we were last there. I do apologise for the banging. I think one of my neighbours has some building work done. So <laughs> if, the, if the listeners can hear that, I do apologise. Um, so yeah, Belgium, um, full field of 156 here at the Soudal Open. Uh, Jordan Smith is the favourite at 20 to 1. Good God. Isn't he always? Just rinse and repeat. Um, well, he did. He closed Val Haller with a 64, which was really good. So mm. I can see why he should be towards the very top of the market. Adrian Otegi is um, 22 to 1, but being backed heavily. So Otegi may well end up as the favourite actually this week. Uh, Thomas Peters, 22s. Yannick Paul, 22s. Bernd Wiesberger, 28 to 1. And then um, it's, it's different prices for some of the other players, but there's 40 to 1 available on the rest of the field bar those players that I've just read through. So, yeah, pretty open, um, certainly towards the top. So, 20 to 1 the field is um, one of these DP World Tour events where the bookies really haven't formed a, a massive opinion, which does give us a, gives us a bit of hope, I think. Now, we're playing at Rinkven International, uh, which has hosted this event for the past two years. Also hosted the Belgian Knockout, which was on the tour from 2018 uh, through 2019 for two seasons. And then also the Telenet Trophy, which was on the Challenge Tour back in 2010. So we've got five events, five course 
or five pieces of course history which are on the stats pages this week so you can check those out versus the players that are in this week's field to see how they played on those events it's a parkland track some holes are tree lines some not so so a bit of a mix um it's a composite of two courses there the north and the south course although the composite together isn't long it's 6940 yards for a par of 71 only two par fives on the course and um, three par threes all of the rest of the holes are par fours so 13 par fours which is um a slightly unusual configuration for a golf course, particularly at this kind of level. Powana greens, but they are overseeded with bent grass. Um, the idea is to get them to be about 80% bent grass, 20% power. So pretty much bent grass greens for the purposes of our analysis. In terms of the weather, really not much to talk about. Um, there may be the odd shower now. Originally, there was likely to be some more heavy rain overnight on thursday friday but um that seems to have dissipated so we may just get the odd shower now sunny spells light winds 70 fahrenheit might be maybe a little bit uh, north of that on sunday so it should be quite pleasant should be quite scorable i think we do have full stats from the two sudal opens that were held here in the last couple of years so we've got something to work with. We've got some pattier stats from the Belgian knockout events. Of course, those events were two rounds of stroke play. And then we had two rounds of um, match play after that. So, <clears throat> excuse me, there, there won't be a great deal of um, uh, data to dig into in that respect. If you look at the two events um, for the Sudel Open, though, 2022, Sam Horsfield won here at 13 under par. He was a 22 to 1 shot. Last year, Simon Forstrom, 17 under for Forstrom, uh, 200 to 1 he was last year, if you managed to pluck him out. Statistically, both men struggled to hit the fairway, um, as did many of the players just below him in the, um, the final leaderboards, in fact. Uh, both of them hit the low 70s in terms of greens and regulation, so there was a lot of scrambling going on, in fact. Scrambling was probably the key statistic to pull out of those two renewals. Horsefield was second for scrambling. Forstrom was first for scrambling. So if you're going to pick some stats, then yeah, make sure you include scrambling as one of your analysis points for this week. Um, similar pattern, really, with many of the contenders. A lot of them um, struggle to hit green so you need to hit as many greens as you possibly can but you're unlikely to be far into the 70 percent really and then save par when you don't hit those greens in terms of the belgian knockouts we've got another couple of winners uh, who are both playing this week actually guido migliozzi um, played well yesterday at the uh, us open qualifying migliozzi adrian otegi um, both of them won the belgian knockout lee slattery won the Telenet Trophy way back in 2010. That was a slightly different setup, slightly different routing. Par 72 that week with four par fives. So less relevance, I think, to this week. Uh, 21 under, Slattery won that week. Lots of par fours here, though. I think you're going to need to score well on um, the par fours to succeed here. Slattery was um, 11 under for the um, uh, event that he won. Horsefield, eight under for the par fours. He only he shot just three under for the par fives on that week. Forstrom last year, 14 under for the par fours, three under for the par fives. So you can see where the scoring needs to be made. It's got to be made in those par fours. So again, if you're going to pluck a stat out to, to dig through, par four scoring isn't a bad number, bad metric to look at, I think. Um. The only other thing, I guess, um, we do have strokes gain data from the last couple of years, but um, it's a bit mixed. Horsefield was third for approach, fifth for putting. Forstrom was second for tee to green and first for around the green. So a um, bit of a mixed bag in that respect. We probably need a few more data points to, to really form an opinion here. And the only other factor I think is of relevance is that um, around about 60, 64, I think it was, of this um, this field were in action yesterday at Walton Heath um, trying to qualify for the US Open. Who qualified? So, have you got a list? Uh, I have got a list, yeah. I, the, the, well most I, the most eye-catching one, I say I've got a list, I've got it on my computer somewhere. 
the most eye-catching one was Robert Rock, who uh, came out of uh, came out of retirement to, <laughs> to, to qualify he's for the US Open. Before, I'm sure he has. Oh, it's mad, isn't it? You know, he's he's, he's hung his boots up and then uh, <laughs> he's come back out and uh, shown the youngsters how it's done. Um, yeah, there were nine who got through: Grant Forrest, Richard Mansell, Brandon Robinson, Thompson. Um, led the way. They all tied at 10 under. Sam Bairstow and Robert Rock, as I mentioned, 9 under. And then uh, Tom McKibben, Eduardo Molinari, Jason Scrivener and Matteo Manassero were the final qualifiers. Mm. Some really good performances there. But um, just below them, there's some, some other players who did play well in patches. So well worth looking. I've put a link to that final leaderboard from yesterday in my preview so um worth considering from a couple of angles i guess because these guys have had to play 36 holes on a monday and then jet over to belgium um so that's going to ham- hamper their preparation time to to some degree but equally if you've got a player who's played a couple of and, and it was nice conditions yesterday it's not as if they were playing in pouring rain and uh you know blowing winds it was it was nice over here in the, in the uk yesterday so um yeah, it's the players who, who put a decent shift in could be uh, coming into this week with a little bit of momentum. So different ways to play the narrative with that, I think, but well worth a look. Um, anyway, I've boiled it down. I've backed four this week. Close to the top, um, not quite at the top, but close enough. I've backed Thomas Peters at 20 to 1, and that was with the eight place each way option with bet 365. You can get slightly longer if you willing to go down the uh, regular each way place route but um, I've gone for the eight place option a pretty rare start for Peters on the DP World Tour Um, he's been a live player now for what just over a year I guess Um, and he gets in this week in the national spot category Um, however he's managed to wangle that but of course he is a he is a local, so um, there's uh, the very few names that would uh, sit above him, I guess, if he wanted to get a start, which he has done. I guess, you know, even if there's a bit of animosity from some of his fellow players here this week, and there's was, there was a lot of noise about John Rahm getting uh, getting the brush off last week, wasn't there, from uh, from some of his fellow PGA Tour players. And even if there is a bit of, uh, bit of needle there, I expect he's going to get so much local support that um, it will just drown it out. So I, w- I wouldn't worry about that from that perspective. If you go back to his pre-live days as well, he'd, he'd be clear favourite for this, wouldn't he? You know, I'd be reading through the odds yeah. list and Peters would be 12 to 1 or 14 to 1. Um, and he's not. He's, he, he's kind of just below the favourites here, which, um, or, you know, amongst the favourites at least. So I think there's a there's the scope for a little bit of uh, a tiny bit of juice I think with him. And it's not as if he's been playing badly. He's been playing against some huge names over on the Live Tour and playing playing nicely over the last few weeks. Ninth at Live Miami, fourteenth Live Adelaide, Adelaide, <laughs> and um, fifth last time out Live Singapore. That was behind uh, Brooks Kepka. So some mm-hmm. some decent form, um, decent stats. Top 14 for both greens in regulation and scrambling, although all, all three of those starts. And actually, he um, he led the field for scrambling at Singapore in that last night. So a nice tick in the box for me. We've seen some of these lift players come over and absolutely mop up, didn't we? At the back end of last year, Dean Bermester, uh, uh, Joaquin Neiman, uh, Louis Oosthausen, uh, all three of them won, didn't they? I think they won five consecutive events at the back end of last year. So, did, yeah. so yeah, seeing seeing uh, Peters come over and do the same wouldn't surprise me. He was ninth here in twenty twenty two, so he's got a little bit of course form as well. So, so yeah, happy to take Peters at the top. Um, also happy to take Johannes Veerman at fifty to one. Um, in fact, Veerman was the first player on my shortlist. I I had him kind of earmarked at the back end of last week. I um, just wanted to see how he played yesterday at Walton Heath before pulling the trigger. Because his most recent form, second um, in India behind uh, Keita Nakajima. That was back in March and eighth last time out in China, just before the the US PGA Championship break. So some decent incoming form. Didn't quite qualify last uh, or yesterday at Walton Heath. Um, Shot a pair of 69s though, so that was solid. A couple of shots short of making the qualifying places, but no disaster and some, some decent stuff in that by the looks of it. 
And there's lots of stats I like for the season as well. Four for, um, or, or eighth for par four scoring is the one that really sticks out. Those two two events that I talked about recently, first and 14th for strokes gain approach, seventh and fifth for strokes gain tee to green, third and sixth for scrambling over those two lofty finishes. Um, course debut this week, but I think Veerman should like this. And, I, I, you know, compared to a lot of the players here, Veerman's a, a class above when he's at his best, I think. And then two longer prices, both of them 100 to 1 now. Matthias Schwab, um, lots of disparity about... I mean, there's been a lot of disparity in this week's field full stop in terms of the prices, but um, Schwab yesterday opened at 50 to 1 in some places and then 125 in others. So lots of differentials there. Um, some, you know, Book is not agreeing what his chances are like. He's kind of settled in that 80 to 100 to 1 bracket now, which I think is probably about right. Uh, he's still a tall maiden, but he's come close a few times. Um, does tend to find his form in patches, though, looking through his record. Mm. So eighth in China last time out. That's interesting because he could be at one of the positive patches or start one of his pos- positive patches right now. Really nice numbers coming out of that performance at Hidden Grace as well. Third for driving accuracy, third for greens in regulation, first for scrambling. Um, in terms of strokes going fifth for approach and tenth for tee to green, really nice numbers coming out of that. That was his seventh straight miss, uh, made cut, so playing some nice consistent stuff as well. Has played a couple of times here, made both the knockout stages when he played the Belgian knockout um, without really pushing on from there, so has some course experience as well. So 100 to 1 was nice. 100 to 1 about Matteo Manassero was also nice. He opened yesterday 150 to 1 uh, with standard places, 125 to 1 in places with eight places each way um, when the market came up. Of course, he was playing nicely at the uh, the Walton Heath uh, qualifier. That price got trimmed as the, as the day went on. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I had to put him up at 100 to 1, but this 100 to 1 still out there right now. And um, yeah, some really nice numbers coming out of what he did yesterday. He shot six birdies in his final eight holes to qualify. That's his first major championship that he'll be playing since 2016. And it's been wow. a real resurgence, hasn't it? And, you know, mm-hmm. from from Manicero. Um, good ten, to see. Yeah, it's good to see. Yeah, 10 years and two days, I counted, since he won at Wentworth to when he won at the Johnson Workwear Open a few weeks back, back in March. That's his fifth win on tour overall now. So we know from his early days when he was a youngster, he won four times in four consecutive years until he won that event in Wentworth and then it just all dried up. But um, seems to be back on the, uh, you know, upward, you know, a sharp upward trajectory right now. Won twice on the Challenge Tour last year and um, within the space of six weeks. And, Given that he won just over six weeks ago, potentially, could he repeat that feat here this week? I think at 100 to 1, he's got to be uh, given a chance to to see what he can do. So, so yeah, Manasero's in, Schwab's in, Johannes Veerman and Thomas Peters, my team of four. You having a play this week, Barry? A uh, little bit, yeah. Put uh, Darius Van Driel in. DVD, yeah, yeah, decent short game. I can see, I can see the logic. Yeah, I had a second here three years ago, or um, and a twenty second last year. So nice, uh, good, good greens and reg stats. Good price at seventy to one. Hmm. You know, it's a you know, the, the, I guess the the locality, neighbouring country to the Netherlands. So let's see if that can merge. I like the Manasero show, Paul. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to have been able to put him up at 150s, but the way he was playing yesterday, it was <laughs> never going to happen. Um, the other one I was looking at was uh, Kyrzek, because mm. we were we were kind of giving out the fact that he was, there was some event we wanted him to play and then he didn't play or something along those lines recently. Oh, he got added well. in the end. That was the one in China. Yeah. Ah, that's what happened. And that was well, it. Okay, so we, we saved money then by not backing him that week, but maybe this is the week. Mm. Maybe, maybe he's uh, yeah, he's been playing nice enough, hasn't he? And uh, he's, he's been that kind of bubble player in terms of the qualification for these events for a few weeks. So it must be really frustrating for him sitting there waiting for people to withdraw as to whether he gets a start or not. But it was a little bit further up the pecking order this week. So 
never in mm. doubt. So yeah, so the preparation's got to have been stronger for him in that respect. Again, he's got the quality, hasn't he? When he's at his best. He was first for T to Gris a few weeks ago, wasn't he? Mm. I think that was, that was I think that was the event in Japan. Yep. And he can pass. He's finding that, something. He's a bit like that's um, what got us Swab. Excited. He's another one you mentioned. I, I mean, I look at their stats. That Matthias Swab, he's getting back to his peak of just fairways and greens, fairways and greens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Dangerous. Yeah. I'm going to go for ADC. Why not? ADC. Adrian Dumont de Chassin. Mm. I'm only putting him up because I wanted to uh, Muller his, his name. name. So <laughs> ADC for me, 45 to 1 I'm going to take with Bet Fred, eight places each way. Mm. I'm going to take Guido as well. Played well yesterday, yeah. He's 45 to 1. I'll take the eight places again with Bet Fred via their pick your place market. I'm going to have to keep backing Kira deck because I have been. And you know what happens when you don't. They win. And I'm going to follow you in on Matteo Manassera. Did he win at... Um, am I making this up? He won at Wentworth years and years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was the, that was his previous win prior to, uh, to, to this one. Or to the most mm. recent one. To year 2014. Why not? He's been absolutely hammered. I mean, I'm seeing 66 to 1 at Skybet. Yeah, and quite rightly as well, Steve. I mean, he played really well yesterday. Um, you know, if you're talking about a Parkland track, then a guy mm. who's got Wentworth in his resume is yeah, really good. And uh, yeah, he's, he's got to be feeling really positive. You know, the only the only possible downside is there's some fatigue coming in, but he's, you know, he's 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 a fit lad, so why not? Why, why yeah, and it's been he? a break, hasn't there? Yeah, been a break exactly. in play. It's not as yeah. if they've been travelling around the world for the last couple. No, of and, and you know, ultimately Belgium from um, uh, from Walton Heath. Yeah, it's, it's not the not the longest of journeys, is it? Just to close the circle on the US Open qualifiers before we disappear into the ether, uh, Barry's favourite, Nico Echeverria. Barry, you you he missed the cut when you backed him the other week. He was the top qualifier for the US Open. In Dallas yesterday, you'll be glad to hear. You're welcome, Nico. <laughs> Mac Meisner <laughs> and the live player, is it Chakara? Was t- they were T2. Tagumi Kanaya and Francesco Molinari, T4. Francesco. Both Molinari's in there. Yeah. yeah. T6, there was a seven-man playoff for six. the last six spots. You're going to love this. Brandon Wu, Michael McGowan, Parker Bell, amateur, S.H. Kim, he's been playing well recently, Sung Kang, Logan McAllister, the guy that lost, the the guy that was the odd one out, Sergio Garcia. Who oh, was he? Oh, wow. That's tough, isn't it? The first man to drop out of a seven-man playoff. He's now first alternate for the US Open. Mm. Wow. Uh, I think there's going to be a there'll be a lot of more US Open qualifiers next week when we're over in uh, Ohio for the Memorial. I think that's when the main crop of qualifiers will be. Yeah. In the states. Uh, by the way, our friend Rio Ishikawa, he qualified the uh, T1 with Riki Kawamoto in Japan, with Teisei Shimizu, the other qualifier. Easy for you to say. Exactly. What was his nickname, Ishikawa? It slips my mind. Uh, Basil Prince. That's the one. So Ishikawa will be Mm. at Pinehurst. I hope your bets go well, chaps. Best luck, boys. You too, boys. I hope the listeners' bets go well. We will be back next week for the Memorial Tournament on the PGA Tour. And what have you got, Paul? Um, It's the European Open that used to be the Porsche, but Porsche appear to have uh, pulled their sponsorship, so it's just the European Open over in Germany. Oh, right. Comes to something when Porsche were pulling out Mm. of uh, sponsoring golf events. There you go. Either that or they forgot to put the logo on the website, one of the two. I've got it wrong. It's the RBC Canadian Open next week from Hamilton Golf and Country Club. 
I believe Rory is playing. We'll see you next week. Cheerio. If you like betting on golf, but everyone that you back misses the cut, get some experts involved with all the stats and the tips and so much more. Cause it's the golf betting system. The golf betting system is the golf betting system.